Hello and welcome, bienvenue, to the Can COVID Speaker Series. I'm absolutely delighted that today we will be joined by Mark Leggett, the Executive Director of Research Data Canada. He will be talking about sharing data from the researcher's view. Uh, we will have time for questions at the, uh, at the conclusion of his presentation. Please feel free to type them into the chat box as we go along and I will read them out or you can turn your monitor on and ask your question yourself. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Mark, take it away. Great. Thanks, Kimberly. Uh, good uh, afternoon, I think, for uh, probably everybody's on the call. Um, and I'm going to go through uh, a few slides uh, fairly quickly, and then uh, hopefully we get uh, some conversation going. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, sponsors for today, the three uh, Tri-Council, uh, both in terms of uh, promoting, but also uh, all the great work that's being done in supporting research in the, these times of the COVID uh, pandemic. So thanks to them. Um, I would also kind of start off the conversation the way I often do with this question, which is what would happen to discovering innovation and in society as a whole if all research outputs were made publicly accessible tomorrow. So this is just my way of framing the conversation and kind of asking that question that um, seems rather obvious in terms of the answer, but I think uh, all of us would look at this one in a slightly different uh, way. Um, Guy Rouleau, who's the director at the MNI in uh, Montreal, this is a quote uh, from Guy, who of course is uh, instrumental uh, nationally in Canada and internationally in promoting an open science uh, approach. And essentially what Guy says is, I look at my research data in a particular way and there's a hundred people out there who would look at it uh, differently. Uh, and uh, it's uh, one of those different ways of looking at uh, the data or the research question may well result in something substantial in terms of uh, new outcomes. So for me, that's a, a pivotal uh, lens or way of looking at the, uh, the data sharing context. Um, Another way of looking at it is uh, as a challenge. And I think this is, um, and I apologize for some of the terms here, whether it's rat race or scoop, but this is uh, verbatim uh, terminology from an article um, that uh, came out a number of years ago, uh, which talked about data sharing in the health context. There's a link to the article there. And of course, I think these uh, slides will be shared by the COVID team after the session. So they, they selected seven challenges or reasons why researchers are hesitant to uh, share data. Um, so I'm not gonna go through all of those, but uh, I think in some of these, you'll see common uh, challenges, whether it's the, that the data is confidential or especially in times like now with the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic challenge, uh, sometimes there just isn't time to get the data in proper shape. Um, so all kinds of reasons um, uh, for or challenges to sharing data, uh, which is why I like to kind of respond to that question and, and Guy's uh, lens in terms of looking at the open sharing of data uh, with this phrase, uh, as open as possible, as closed as necessary. Uh, this has been around for a while. It's kind of emerged, I think, out of the European conversations around sharing data in the Horizon 2020. Uh, and other funding contexts. And it's, I think it's a very simple, uh, non startling, sometimes, you know, data must be open or phrases like that tend to be, uh, I think, get people's backs up. And, and I think in many respects, justifiably so. So I think as open as possible, as closed as necessary, does allow the researcher to consider uh, what are the reasons why their data uh, can't be shared. Uh, and if there is a challenge like uh, the data's in poor shape or research is just not comfortable sharing the data in its current form, then maybe it will, will spur the opportunity to add uh, in a funding application or some other context funds to, uh, to get the data in better shape. So I think by, by considering this phrase, one considers the opportunities to make the, the data as open as possible. So that's just kind of the uh, the framing 
context. And uh, again, I'd be happy to talk about uh, some of the issues and challenges with data sharing. Um, I did want to focus in a fair amount of the time on today's uh, brief webinar on the Research Data Alliance's COVID-19 guidelines and recommendations, which were uh, released a couple of months ago. Um, the Research Data Alliance, for those that aren't familiar, is a grassroots network. It's about 12,000 members, uh, or approaching 12,000 members now. Uh, very much a bottom-up uh, kind of organization that is focused on things associated with research data, and in particular, uh, the sharing of data. And in the green box in the, in the right-hand side, you can see RDA's guiding principles. Um, so with those guiding principles as the uh, defining characteristics of RDA's platform, as we call it, uh, the European Commission asked RDA to consider an exercise to uh, come up with a set of guidelines and recommendations with a focus on researchers, but also uh, targeting funders, uh, journal publishers, uh, research infrastructure providers, all manner of uh, of actors in the in the data and research ecosystem. So we took on that challenge, and within um, two weeks, we had a, a 600 volunteers from the RDA community, and also some who had never been participating in RDA before, come forward. We pulled together uh, four research areas and four cross-cutting themes, which I will describe in a few minutes. And there were weekly calls of co-chairs and moderators and and uh, editorial team and people working on uh, the details. Uh, we had a, a sprint approach uh, to creating the guidelines and recommendations. So over the course of, of a couple of months, once we got up and running, there were six releases um, and resulting in the final uh, release on the 30th of June. So with that uh, kind of background, uh, the challenges that uh, we were asked to consider was the critical need for, for rapid data sharing. I think in research, obviously writ large, but in particular, uh, given the concerns around the, uh, the pandemic and needing to find appropriate responses from the research community to deal with it, whether it's from a health context, the social, financial, whatever the case may be. Um, we recognize that in times like this, there can often be a, a trade-off between timeliness and precision, kind of coming back to my earlier remarks. Um, and that there was, uh, and still is, a lack of harmonized universal standards and context, uh, whether that be in collecting the data, documenting it, or, or disseminating it. Uh, so we looked at how to facilitate uh, this challenge by making a series of recommendations uh, regarding uh, the sharing of data and the reusability of data. Um, so, not too much more, I think, on this one. The again, the guidelines were targeted at researchers, but we also had a series of um, of guidelines and recommendations that targeted uh, other uh, actors in the ecosystem that support researchers uh, in their efforts. Uh, there were you know, there's 140 some pages, uh, some of it, as you'll see with an example in a moment, uh, very detailed. Um, there were a number of um, key recommendations. I just, uh, uh, we've highlighted 13 of those recommendations here in a section of an infographic that was created to support the outputs. And I would just highlight, highlight a couple of them that tend to be personal um, uh, pet peeves, I suppose you could say, in one sense, or, or particularly, uh, or statements that resonate in particular for me. One is uh, recommendation three, which is to invest in state-of-the-art IT uh, data management systems, infrastructure, uh, economies of scale, and people. Uh, and this uh, part of my daily job is as a funder with the Canary Organization funding data management uh, initiatives. But also in my on the other side of my my uh, my office is uh, Research Data Canada, which facilitates a conversation around best practices. So for me, one of the biggest issues in this ecosystem is the lack of a sustainable, cohesive approach to funding uh, research infrastructure. I think writ large, but uh, across the the scale from the network up to the software and the people at all those layers that support that infrastructure. 
Um, another one I would highlight uh, would be the uh, number six, using common metadata standards and persistent identifiers. Um, sometimes people have accused me of being a bit kid-centric, persistent IDs being the kids in that statement. But for me, the ability to uh, discover, access, uh, and, and register uh, the affiliation or the impact of research to a particular researcher or research team is critical and is only really possible when one uh, makes effective use of the full range of kids, whether it's something like an ORCID uh, that identifies you as a researcher uh, or a DOI that identifies a particular piece of uh, research. So for me, if we could, if we could really wrestle that kid uh, piece uh, effectively in a global scale, I think not only would researchers be more likely to share their data, uh, it would be easier to do so, but researchers would be more likely to share their data because the impact and the association of that data with their efforts uh, would be much, uh, much more robust and clear. So just two examples out of those. Uh, so the, the four thematic areas that we focused in on were clinical omics. In that particular case of this uh, version, it was um, genomics, metabolomics, lipidomics, proteomics. Um, so there, we, there was a touch uh, on all of those kinds of uh, omics. Uh, epidemiology and the social sciences. So those are the, far, the four kind of specific disciplinary uh, lenses through which we focused on guidelines and recommendations. Then we also had four what we called cross-cutting themes, which were community, in particular meaning uh, community participation by those who were interested in facilitating research around COVID-19, whether it be as someone who was infected and wants to participate in clinical trials or uh, whatever the case may be. Uh, research software, indigenous data, uh, and legal and ethical considerations. So just to give you a sense, um, and I realize this is a really quick uh, high-level overview, but hopefully this would will uh, encourage you to take a closer look at the guidelines and recommendations. This is one example of one section uh, from the omics piece. Uh, you can see that some of the recommendations are very specific uh, down to the specific research article that introduced or introduces or highlights a, a best practice data repository. Uh, wherever possible, uh, the team made every effort to, to cite the canonical uh, source of the recommendation. And typically that's a, a, an academic peer reviewed article that highlighted, uh, again, the origins of or uh, the current uh, instantiation of a particular uh, research infrastructure. So the genomics, as you can well imagine, um, there's a lot of very complex and, and, uh, and large data within the, the uh, omics context. So a lot of these recommendations are, are quite specific as, as you see here. They're also uh, higher level, um, you know, kind of uh, best practice, uh, almost motherhood and apple pie kinds of recommendations in terms of data sharing. There's also sections like the legal and ethical uh, one, which tends to be higher level, um, but also is somewhat constrained by the difficulty in reflecting, in particular, the legal context of something like health research in all of the jurisdictions uh, across the globe. Uh, so the document does attempt to take a high level approach recognizing that um, the specific local jurisdictional legal or ethical context may well uh, be different or may be uh, important differences reflected in local uh, laws and regulations. Um, one of the goals that the original team had, and we used something called the data stewardship wizard to create a kind of a navigational tool. And one of the goals we had with that tool was that local jurisdictions would add to the level, uh, add to the original guidelines and recommendations with specific references to more local um, guidelines and recommendations. So even though the final version of the document was released at the end of June, uh, the efforts continue. Um, this is just one example. Uh, the epidemiology team 
uh, was in a position where they had to kind of uh, summarize the results of their discussion so that they fit into a reasonably uh, a reasonable length of document. So a lot, but there were a lot of details that weren't included. So that uh, group has gone ahead and published some additional outputs that reflect additional detail in terms of uh, data sharing uh, in the epidemiology context. Coming back to my earlier comments, there has also uh, been uh, a local Canadian effort to synchronize uh, the Canadian uh, on the ground context, whether it's data repositories or some specific guidance reflecting the Canadian legal or ethical context. Uh, so this effort was led by the Portage Network uh, which is a, a large network of uh, uh, academic librarians as well as colleagues in research offices and uh, data repositories and, and other kinds of uh, actors in the ecosystem. And they put together a series of uh, five separate documents, which are linked to in this uh, slide, that highlight additional resources from the Canadian context. So this is the kind of thing that the, uh, the RDA team was hoping we would see uh, in the effort as it uh, continued. And then finally, um, probably the best place to get a sense of not just of the that kind of canonical PDF document, as it were, which are the guidelines and recommendations. There is a, a web page called the value of RDA for COVID-19 with that link at the bottom. And this is probably the best place to go to get a sense of the, the fulsome reaction of the broad international community uh, to this effort and the continued effort there have there are links here to webinars and upcoming archived webinars as well as upcoming ones as well as additional journal articles endorsements by funders and other agencies uh, journal publishers uh, the uh, one of the first endorsers of the the rda guidelines uh, was the stm publishers which is a organization that represents some of the largest uh, academic publishers in the world. Uh, so they um, came uh, to RDA fairly quickly to see uh, if uh, they could endorse the recommendations as a useful um, uh, resource for the for the community. Um, so that's all I have, Kimberly, in terms of, as I said, a very quick introduction to the landscape. And I uh, thought it would be useful to uh, consider any questions that folks might have yeah i think that i think that's great and um certainly uh specific questions given the volume of the information that you have available for for people i wonder if maybe they have some specific questions to get started in terms of directing the sharing of their own research or um if they've had experience in different contexts so if anybody would like to turn on their video monitor or raise their hand or type a question in the chat box, please do go ahead. Uh, Guillaume says, can you tell us about the actual adoption of some of these recommendations? So who's adopted them? Uh, well, there is, uh, so the guidelines and recommendations, the adoption, as you can well imagine, would happen at different levels. So you do have uh, a form of adoption and endorsements, like the one I mentioned with the STM publishers, uh, the European Commission, which originally asked for the guidelines to be uh, created. Uh, so you have that kind of level of endorsement. Mm -hmm. um, the adoption of the guidelines and recommendations is a very interesting question, both in the context of these specific guidelines and recommendations, but any, I'll call it research output. It's really difficult to measure the impact or, and or if you use your uh, term, uh, Guillaume, the adoption of specific elements of the recommendations because there is no really gr good way uh, to determine when a particular recommendation or guideline in the document is subsequently adopted by a research team or a researcher or an organization unless they let us know. So one of the things, I think it actually just went out earlier today, we have prepared a survey uh, that will go out to the broader community to try and actually respond to that very question. And that is how, how impactful have the recommendations been? Have there been specific adoption? Um, 
So that's at the RDA level. But of course, many of the recommendations that made it into the document are, are best practices within specific domains, mm -hmm. which would reflect in, in many uh, you know, real cases adoption at the level of specific uh, research domains as well. Guillaume, did I see you turn your video on? Did you have a follow-up? It was just to show that I was nodding. Uh, thank you for the answer, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Robert Paul Jester has a question. When collecting online survey and questionnaire data, what kind of budget should one anticipate to promote data sharing? Wow, good question. <laughs> um, I think, you know, it's a, uh, it's a difficult question because I think many researchers would be facing in terms of the, the creation of an instrument and, and sending it out and, and analyzing it and doing all those things you associate with that kind of tool, you're going to be using the resources typically that your institution makes available. Again, thinking of, of researcher, many researchers in this context being uh, academic uh, higher education researchers. So I think the answer to what the cost is, is, is varies quite widely depending on the nature of the resources and the supports that you have. Um, you know, from commercial tools to um, open source tools uh, that are available for researchers to use for that type of uh, function. So I, I don't know that I could, would be able to answer the question unless I'm misinterpreting the, uh, the intent of the question with respect to uh, questionnaires in the context of research. Do you think that uh, if I could if I could take a stab at modifying the question, do you think that online su online survey and questionnaire data's uh, would have a higher budget need um, than good old pen and paper, than a non digital, given the data sharing protections that are well, necessary? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, certainly rolling out a survey, whether you're using a, you know, an open source Lyme survey kind of tool or a commercial survey like a survey monkey, I think the the cost of of creating, preparing, disseminating, analyzing uh, a survey and the results of that survey, I would say are much less in the online context than they would be uh, in a traditional analog, if you will context. Um, so yeah, I would think that the cost would be, I mean, I'm just thinking of, a, of an open source tool like Lime Survey, uh, which you can, uh, you can Google. It's a very effective uh, survey tool. It's quite capable. It produces open output. Um, and if you can, you know, get your institution, this is what I was referring to earlier, you can get your institution to install it in an institutional server context then act, creating a survey, accessing it, and making it available to your, your research community is quite straightforward and has marginal cost. So that's a good tip. Work with your institution. Uh, so uh, Michael Wolfson asks, what roles, if any, have government privacy commissioners played in developing these guidelines? Uh, there certainly were some uh, legal scholars. There were a few folks that are, have a privacy uh, context. Uh, I, I myself was a privacy uh, um, officer at two university universities in Canada for 20 years. Um, so there certainly was an element of of privacy officer, I'll say, review of the material. Having said that, I, we did not have a specific you know, a subgroup or review group uh, that was composed mostly of privacy officers. Um, a lot of the participants were from the European uh, mm -hmm. context, so the GDPR uh, would have factored in quite uh, in a substantial way in the development of the guidelines and recommendations. And certainly as a former privacy officer, I would consider the GDPR as um, best practice from my perspective in two primary ways. One is protecting the privacy of folks about whom research might be about. Uh, but also uh, something that a lot of people don't realize is that the GD uh, GDPR provides substantial uh, leeway for researchers to use what would be considered private information for the purposes of research when it has the broader societal benefits. 
so a lot of people, I think, kind of look at the GDPR from uh, the constraints it puts around, for example, research, but the, the creators of the GDPR uh, were very careful to ensure that research would not be stymied or otherwise uh, um, challenged by this uh, vexing, for some people, privacy issue. So I would, if you're interested in the privacy context, I would take a really close look at the research uh, I forget what the term they used was, but the research aspects of the GDPR that facilitate research when it comes to private information. It's very informative. Great. Um, Sarah Lynn has a very intriguing question. What are some ways to overcome the seven challenges with data sharing? You know, that's a great question. <laughs> that's what I thought. Great question. <laughs> it's, um, you know, I've been having these conversations with colleagues in the research community for decades. And at the end of the day, I think it's a slow burn personal conversation, first and foremost. Every researcher has a personal uh, investment in terms of time and resources and, and uh, look at their data in a very personal way, uh, which is informed by their discipline of you know, community of practice. But at the end of the day, I found the most effective way to, to respond to those seven concerns and get ourselves to the point where data is as open as possible and as close as necessary is very often a personal conversation that deals with the very specific elements and concerns of each researcher. Having said that, I think uh, the new National DRI organization or INDRIO as we affectionately call it, uh, the Portage Network, Research Data Canada, international organizations like CoData, are all very good at facilitating the conversation in a group context uh, to uh, encourage researchers to consider uh, options to those seven concerns and ways to change the culture. And then the final thing I would say is each of you in terms of researchers at individual institutions need to lobby the institution to consider the importance of data sharing in a promotion and tenure context, uh, both in terms of your institution and um, journal publishers, because until those two, well, three, journal publishers, uh, funders, and our local institutions embrace data sharing as key to resolving challenges like the COVID-19 pandemic, I think it'll continue to be a slow burn and a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Have you seen, um efforts in this arena because uh you know canada canada new grants now have a component of data sharing to them don't don't they or or uh, it, it's suggested i suppose yeah there's there's a the welcome trust is probably one to my mind one of the better funders and uh, bill and melinda gates as well uh, mm -hmm. in terms of saying if you're going to take our money you have to publish your journal article you know within six months of the research being completed and the article being written. You have to share your data set, and make it accessible. So some of the private funders, are, I think, are a little more capable of saying, uh, we're not going to give you any money unless. But they also take that money. And so, for example, if you want to publish in Nature, Nature will not allow you to make your article open access uh, without a large fee. And so the Bill and Melinda, uh, Melinda Gates Foundation has said, we will pay a blanket fee for nature for researchers that receive our funding so that their article will be open access when it's published in one of the nature journals. So you do get some efforts like that. Um, I think the tri councils had a very good uh, data management policy and it was recently uh, delayed to allow uh, researchers to respond to the realities of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but having said that, there, when the actual data management policy I thought was very good, but I would even say that that policy could be a little stronger in terms of requiring researchers to make articles open access and to deposit their data. So it's a, it's a delicate dance, no question. But some progress. <laughs> some progress. I, would, I was, uh, I mean, I've at various times I look at what researchers are doing with the COVID response to COVID-19 pandemic and I go, awesome, open science is 
is showing what it can do in, in times of a, of a, a severe uh, issue like the, the pandemic. And then there are other days where I go, you know, the pandemic has simply encouraged nas nationalistic approaches to things like vaccine development. And we're taking a step back from open science in order to facilitate that kind of national mm. uh, progress, if you will. Um, so I have good days and I have bad days, <laughs> but overall, I would say I, I hold out hope that uh, the data sharing um, mojo will be strong in the Canadian context. Well, that's good to hear, and I, I like to I like to uh, look at the silver lining. So, I I will I'll hold positive. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you for sharing this great information. If it's okay, maybe we can uh, post this your slide deck in the data sharing channel on Can COVID. So that way, uh, if people want to talk about more data sharing, they can access your deck and participate in the conversation there. That's I will I will send it to you, Kimberly, so you can. Do that it in sounds great. Um, so I will also have it if anybody would like it. I, I'm happy to um, send it to you, Kimberly.Colburn at cancovid.ca. Uh, thank you so much. And we will, and thank you so much to the Tri Councils as well for co sponsoring this event. And I will see everyone next week. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks, Kimberly. Cheers.